JamesAllen.com is the online destination to easily design a customized engagement ring and save up to 50% compared to traditional stores. You pick a diamond, whether it's lab-created or earth-created, James Allen has over 200,000 conflict-free stones. Then, you pick your ring setting and metal. And if you need some help, they have real-time diamond consultations available, where an expert can walk you through it all. Get 25% off your order at jamesallen.com code podcast. That's jamesallen.com code podcast. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. I'm here to tell you about Bowl & Branch Sheets. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bolin Branch sheets get softer with every wash. They're made from the rarest organic cotton and designed to get even softer over time. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee plus 15% off your first order with code ODYSSEY. So head to B-O-L-L and branch.com today. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Welcome to the PowerCat Podcast, GoPowerCat.com's Kansas State Athletics Show. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, from the GPC Studios, here's your host, GoPowerCat publisher, Tim Fitzgerald. Welcome to an NCAA Tournament edition of the PowerCat Questions Podcast, sponsored by Fridge Wholesale Liquor. Since... We have two guys in New York City right now probably committing crimes. If I had to bet on two guys to go on a like a crime rampage in New York City, it would be Zach Carlson and Ryan Gilbert at this moment. I mean, they're the small town kids unleashed on the big city. It's almost like their parents left them for Christmas and, and went on a family trip. They'll just be out there doing their their vandalism and treating people poorly. But I'm Tim Fitzgerald, and that's Cole Carmody, and that's your podcast crew today. And there's not even dogs in the studio. We don't know what the hell's going on. The dogs are off getting beautified. They're they're at their spa day, and we're here working. It's lonely. It's weird. Well, I want dogs get a spa day. I wasn't greeted when I opened the door. Oh. Typically, for those of you who uh, listen to this podcast regularly, you know that every time we come over to the studio, the dogs bark. When the dogs didn't bark... Uh-huh. I got worried. It was weird for me. I even knew they were gone. Dude runs around. He's happy that everyone's here. He gets to play with other humans, and Daphne is scared of her own shadow. That's pretty much the duality of the dog life here in Manhattan, Kansas. But again, we're sponsored by The Fridge. I think you probably have something big on your plate Thursday afternoon, unless you're going to New York like someone across from me. <clears throat> You probably need some liquor from the fridge. You need some beer. You need some, you know, something to get you through. And I'm telling you, folks, uh, I mentioned this in my daily delivery. I usually go to these games. I usually cover these games. But because of my my ongoing health issues, uh, I have some radiation treatments. I had an appointment yesterday in Topeka with my KU Med crew. I, I couldn't go. I don't know how you people watch these things on TV. We're going to talk more about that, by the way. I, I, I'm about self-destructed. One game, I had to use alcohol to get through it, honest to God. And then the second game with Kentucky, I I had work to do on Sunday. I couldn't have alcohol. And I'm like, whoa, Becky had to leave the room. The dogs hated me. It's so much different. It's completely different. I couldn't do it for football. I don't know how people would get through it for football. How can I sit on press row totally disassociated as best I can from the game, just sit there and watch. But at home, I'm like, the pressure cookers, even, I don't understand. I'm not even in the environment. But I hear from uh, Mr. Cole that we have some good questions from Wabash Station. So if you're done at the fridge, if you're back already, uh, congratulations. That's how quick you can get in and out of there because they know what they're doing. They know where to put everything you need. And then you're back out. Uh, Welcome back to the show. Let's get going with your questions from Wabash Station. The first question of the podcast comes from CW Powercat. Hold on. Uh, Cole, CW Powercat, I'm sure, has a good question. I'm sure sure this is the question that wins us an Emmy. Can we win an Emmy? Is that what it it is? We're not on TV. An Oscar. 
Uh, yes. Not right either. Anyhow, uh, if you enjoy our podcast and maybe the daily mm. delivery and all the free stuff going on at Go Power Cat, we appreciate it very much. And that's how the site's designed. It's supposed to be approachable for people that are, you know, all in different positions in life. We're not going to be just behind a paywall for the people paying us only, but there is some great stuff behind the paywall, including most of our recruiting recruiting coverage, a lot of our analysis and opinion. We have everything covered at Go Power Cat. We're having a 50% off sale right now to celebrate the Sweet 16 24-7. Kick that in gear for us on Monday night. 50% off. You can get a new subscription to Go Power Cat. Off you go for a year in K-State sports. That will be well worth it. What a sweet deal. Oh, my gosh. The football season's going to be amazing. Uh, basketball's ongoing. You'll catch into the you know next year's basketball season when they get rolling. Uh, it's it's going to be absolutely amazing. It's fun to cover Kansas State sports, but it's a lot more fun as a fan if you go ahead and subscribe to Go Power Cat. We have a great message board community. If you've had bad experiences with message board communities where it's just kind of hostile and vile, which every school has message boards like that, and if you've experienced that somewhere at K-State, come on over to Go Power Cat. Our community is wonderful. Do we have little spats once in a while? Sure. we got a bunch of people in there that are passionate about a topic, whether it's K-State sports or or Cole's haircut. Mm -hmm. People are very passionate about that. Mm -hmm. um, come on in. You'll, you'll enjoy the community. And also, uh, to every K-Stater here, far, on the moon, in Africa, for the Michael Beasley mm -hmm. fans, uh, Estonia, happy Jerome Tang Day. Yeah, this is one year ago Jerome Tang was hired to coach Kansas State's basketball team. I don't know about you. I think he's done a pretty good job. It didn't take long. No, no, he promised to elevate, and here we are. What are we doing here? We've been elevated. That's how it happened. Now back to your questions from All Rest Station. Here we go from CW Powercat. Where does Marquise Noel's game rank on the Mount Rushmore of KSU men's basketball game performances? So there's so many layers here. I've been, I've been thinking about this. First of all, let me say, before we answer this question, there was multiple questions that were like this. Okay. There was another question that brought up Barry Brown against Kentucky yep. Yep. and Jacob Pullen against Xavier and wanted us to rank those three. So this is kind of a combination of those two questions. Um, so shout out to everyone who asked this question. This is a hot topic on, yeah. on the board. I would put Pullen above what Marquise did just because that was an epic game in the Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. As was Barry Brown's performance against Kentucky that led to the Elite Eight. But I, I feel like what Marquise did rose above Barry because of how much better he made everyone else on the court. And that's not a slide against Barry. That wasn't Barry's game. Barry wasn't the point guard. Um, and, and that's probably why I would put Barry third on that list because Jake and Marquise were the creators while creating for themselves, which is you know, challenging to get that balance. And we've seen Marquis struggle with that. Worry too much about himself, worry too much about others. Mo, he was right in the sweet spot. It was just right. It, that, that, that bed was just right. To me, this is a game where Marquis had to be great. Like, yep. I think that's why this is so impressive. And I think that's why I, I'm with you. I think it's right up there with Jake's game against Xavier. Those are probably the, in my lifetime anyway, the two games that I look at and say, this is when a player took over a game. Marquise had to be special because let's face it, Keontae wasn't the type of special he's been all season long. He hit that huge three pointer at the end of the game, which just is a credit to how good he is, right? I mean, to not be on your game and then to have the confidence to know that you're going to make a shot when you need to make a shot. That's, that was a big time shot from Keontae Johnson. But this, this game for Marquise Noel was, was impressive and it was truly incredible because we'll, we'll kind of get into um, everything that was going into it. But I mean, everything that Marquise Noel did in that game, he did right. There were so many things that he did right. And all year we've talked about, if he can limit the turnovers, he's going to be a special player. Well, he limited the turnovers. He scored 27 points. He had nine assists. And he hit one of the biggest threes I think people overlook in this game. When K-State's down by four, he's guarded. He hits, it takes a step back three and brings it to a one-point game. I mean, what can you say? That, that's the stuff of legend. It really was. It, it was. And it's amazing how one game can reframe someone's 
entire perception of, of who they are as a player when you rise to those moments and more moments away await so can this team rise up again and do it again. The good news is Keontae Johnson didn't even play well. Uh, that's that's what uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around. Not everything went their way. Let's be honest here. To beat Kentucky in 2018 and get to this, you know, past the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight, kind of everything had to go right. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was a physical mismatch along with a talent mismatch. I still laugh that, you know, down the stretch, their point guard was taller than the tallest person on the floor for yeah. K State. It was like some kind of sick joke of a high school game where, yeah. you know, I uh, felt like K State was hickory. Yeah, you know, I just didn't have a chance. Run the pick of fence. Yeah, oh my gosh. But uh you know, this game was this game was evenly matched. And Jerome Tang's right, K State had better dudes. And and I think when we see how upset the fans at Kentucky are about Jerome Tang's comment, uh, they're uh emotionally stunted when they get upset by that. I mean, almost like children, but they're not really upset about what he said. They're upset that he's right. Yep, they know it's true, and they they shouldn't. It shouldn't be that way, because they won't say it out loud. But we've been cheating for years at Kentucky. We've been bringing in the one and dones. How could you possibly have better dudes at little old K State? Not understanding the history of K State, of course. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't, and I understand that. But uh, yeah, it's it's it was something else to see. Next question kind of ties right into that. Fitz, I hope you have your bleeper ready. Uh, have you ever seen a bigger hoe in college basketball than John Calipari? Oh, my gosh. Kim. I, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm sure you're referring to hoe as a, as a guard implement <laughs> yes. tool because he is a tool he also. Um, what? I, I've been around Coach Calipari. You know, K-State played them. Uh, God, what even year was it? It was in St. Louis. We, you know, I remember it as the food poisoning year. Would that have been 2014 when they played in the tournament? Yeah, it was K State, KU, Wichita State, and Kentucky were all eight at, nine matchup. Yeah, it was just a mess. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kentucky was so much better than K State that day. I got food poisoning and had to leave the middle of the Cal Perry press conference. Um, but he's just a pretentious asshat. Yeah. He always has been. He's not as bad as Jim Beheim, but now that Coach Beheim's retired, he is the grand asshat of college basketball. But I, I, I found it interesting in this when he didn't have the dudes, because he didn't and he knew it, what a whiny, foul begging, call begging all he did was worry about the officials and not his team. Uh you you try to trap Marquise Noel with two big dorks? Dude, you don't have the dudes. No. You can't do that. That didn't work. But you kept trying things that weren't working. He got out coached, circles ran around him. The players for K State were better. Uh, and let's be honest, they got the calls. Mm-hmm. That's what's funny about it. They had like four fouls in the entire second half until they started fouling it down the stretch. There was a there was a, a sequence in the second half where K State had three fouls called them called on them in a single possession. And all three of them were not fouls. There yeah. was a reach in on Desi Sills that should have been a jump ball, and then there was a a reach in on David Gasson against Oscar Shibwe, who, by the way, took four steps every single time he catched the ball. I don't I don't understand that that aspect. And then I think there was another foul I can't specifically remember. And you know, I, I I know I know some officials um, in high school in the high school ranks, and just talking with them, it's like. They don't officiate the game the same way for Oscar Shibwe no. that they do for other bigs. And it's almost like the officials get caught up in the, this is the guy in college basketball in in the interior. And we got to let him play his game. If I'm the NBA, I appreciate his skill set. But I also look at how many of his rebounds are against lesser athletes in terms of strength. Mm-hmm. Um, that he can bully around that he won't be able to do in the NBA and how lazy he is about positioning because he's allowed to come over the back. Mm -hmm. Uh, We put the daily delivery today is about the great iconic photo, Barry, Barry Brown, Jacob (laughs) Pult, of Marquise Noel uh, slamming the ball down. It turns out it was after um, a layup, you know, he drove the lane and bodied Shibwe jumped into him a hair. So he couldn't jump Mm and put it up and in. 
Uh, I didn't remember what play it was, and I just saw it on a highlight reel. And he slams the ball down. That doesn't spike it. He just places it firmly on the ground, and the Kentucky players are begging the ref for yeah. a call. It just kind of sums things up. Uh, but in in watching some of those other highlights, the guy is blocked out consistently, and he just literally there's a there's a photo of him just completely leaning on and reaching over David Gasson. He's not above him. He's He's totally leaning on him during the reach over. Gasson's about to be broken in half, and that there was no foul called. He did it over and over, and yet Calipari's the one whining about calls. It's it's hysterical because Kentucky's like Kansas; they're so used to getting every call when they need it. When that doesn't happen in the NCAA tournament, they're screwed. I've been trying to tell KU fans that. This happens quite often to them, and it happened again. They didn't get screwed by the referees in the Arkansas game. They didn't get the number of calls they're used to, Mm -hmm. and it felt like you were screwed. You didn't get the prime seating at the corner booth when you walked in the restaurant. You were treated like everyone else and sat at a foretop in the middle of the restaurant, and you feel like you got crappy service. No, you got the service everyone else does. Oh, I, I I just love watching a blue blood cry that poor us. Yeah. Ah, screw you guys. And, I, and we got to touch on what Calipari said about Marquise Noel, too. Um, after the game, referring to Marquise Noel as the little kid, the little I think it was exactly said that the little kid made a few three pointers. And I've seen this discussed. And Fitz, I've almost came to the conclusion. I wonder how much he even prepared for K-State. Like how much of this was this left up to the assistants to say, you guys are the ones who are in charge of this. I'm going to go, you know, do what I need to do. Rather that be make TV appearances, make my radio appearances. I'll coach the game. I'll be vaguely informed of what they do. But you guys are the ones who are who are tasks who are tasked with game planning for this team because it's almost like he saw K State's roster and said, I'm more talented than them. We're going to be fine if we play our game. Right. As long as we stop Keontae Johnson, we'll figure it out. And they did a good job on Keontae. Sure did. But they didn't do a good job on Noel. And for him not to say his freaking name in the press conference is absolutely ridiculous. And if I'm a Kentucky fan, I'm embarrassed that the guy that just dropped 27 points on my favorite team, my coach doesn't even know his name. He didn't scout him well enough. Ridiculous. And on top of that, I agree with everything you said. But he's got the stats. When you're at the podium, you've got the stats. He can look down and look at the number and try to read the name. Maybe you'll get the name wrong and people will be pissed about that. But say his name, you disrespectful, entitled son of a bitch. Say his name. I hope I come across him in a press conference setting. I'm going to ask him. I might just ask him about that game. And do you remember the name of the point guard? (laughs) The third-team All-American point guard. Yeah, it's not like he came out of nowhere. Yeah. He's a first-team All-Big 12, third-team All-American guy. He's been one of the most dynamic players in college basketball this year. Has he had his up moments? Yeah. Has he had his down moments? Sure. But that was an up moment. And for you not to even bother with his name after you go to the press conference, F off, man. I mean, just go. It's a bad look. Yeah. It's a bad look. Kids, what? don't go play for this no. this trash coach. I mean, he's selling you, and I'll get you to the NBA. Kentucky's got to get rid of him. They, they have to get rid of him if they want to have a program. Because in this day of the transfer portal, first of all, the one-and-done plan hasn't really worked. Nope. <clears throat> They've been good. But at some point, the kids are like, I'm not even here. I'm not. I'm just here paying my dues. i got to mm-hmm. go. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the NBA. I don't want to hurt myself here. I'm not invested in Kentucky. I don't care about Kentucky. I just this is my this is my penance. I, I didn't see any NBA players on that team, by the way. There was nobody that stood out to me and was like, "This guy is going to play in the NBA." Yeah, that team was far less talented than the one we saw in 2018. Yeah. That I think there's three NBA guys off that team. I think Sheba is an NBA mm-hmm. guy, but he's going to have a rude awakening when he gets there. Yep. There's going to be guys just as strong and bigger than him. I'll teach him a lesson or two. Yep. Next question comes from B Foster one nine five nine. Another hot topic on the boards: Does Marquise Noel belong in the rafters? If no, what does he have to do to get there? 
Uh, yeah, uh, I, you know, I saw someone on the boards did a 180. I saw someone on Twitter do a 180. <clears throat> I kind of wrestled with it um, because really this is a one season flash, but we're now kind of finding out this one season is pretty spectacular. And if the holdback on Michael Beasley is one season and he doesn't have a K-State degree, I understand that. But are we really now, if we're going to put Marquise Noel up on the basis of one season, Mike needs to go up too because I come back to our discussions about the Pac-12, Big 12 realignment. Why are we worrying about a degree? Mm -hmm. I mean, K-State doesn't get many one and dones. This guy was spectacular and he should be up there. Marquise being a third-team All-American, Keontae being a third-team All-American, certainly puts him in the discussion. Now, we've got other All-Americans from black and white TV days that need to be up there, and they need to correct that in the next few years before these guys are eligible to go up. But um, unless Marquise does something that is absolutely horrible, caught fixing the game, you know, does something off the court, which he won't, yeah, he's going into the rafters. Keontae might, even though he's third-team All-American, still have something to prove. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting on my perspective here, and I, I'm, I'm more than willing to accept if you think this is unfair, the fact that Keontae transferred to K-State kind of as, he wasn't a complete product because of his situation, but he had proven himself at another school before his health situation. It feels like it's less about K-State. Marquise feels like it's about K-State. He came from Arkansas Little Rock, where he was good. He was good. And then he played for Bruce Weber, and he was okay. And now in his final year under Jerome Tang, he's absolutely phenomenal. If he can find a way to bottle that type of game four more times, K-State might win a national championship. Two more times, he'll go to the Final Four. If, If this team plays like it did against Kentucky, it will beat Michigan State. And it will take down Tennessee or Florida Atlantic. I'm sure it will be Tennessee. Yeah. The bracket's open. There's no excuses here. There's no bad matchups. This, you're the highest, highest seeded team in mm-hmm. Madison Square Garden. The media didn't want to treat you that way. The odds makers certainly aren't treating you that way. But let them keep making mistakes. And those of us who bet on Kansas State, money line, appreciate being mm-hmm. a, an underdog. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. I'm I'm with you. Everything you said to me, he's he's proven what he he's proven what he can do. He's proven that he needs to be up there. I agree with what you said about Mike. I mean, but Marquise is he's special. I mean, the transformation he's made and he's made it for K State. Right. I think that's another reason why he belongs in the rafters. He's doing this for K State. Um, he embodies everything that it means to be a K State Wildcat, underappreciated, overlooked, but still consistently being a pain in the ass for everybody. Yep, I agree. Next question comes from AmeriCat. Fitz, what was better slash worse from an analysis perspective from the at-home experience this week? Probably having to listen to the horrible rims, right? Oh, my God, those rims were awful. Yeah, terrible. Awful. I, the I, ball bounced like five feet in the air every time you missed a shot. It was crazy. They sounded loose, but they weren't. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Don't ever go back to Greensboro. It was terrible. And, like, how many times did a missed three end up on top of the backboard? I know. I noticed that multiple times throughout all the games there. It's like you never see that happen in the Big 12. And the other thing the referees noted how many wedgies is what they were calling them happened at that site. Mm -hmm. I think the goals were put up wrong. I think the rims were out too far. Did you see that? I don't know what game it was, but there was a free throw. The guy shot, and it stuck on the back part of the it's goal settled on top of the back see I, that's what i think i think that bracket that comes out from the backboard was too deep i think the rims were on wrong the mm-hmm. entire tournament and how that happens at this level is beyond me but something was weird a lot of weird stuff was happening hopefully madison square garden knows how to put basketball goal i think they have some experience in they've that. done it a few times yeah it's it was so weird it, it honest to god folks you know I was home during the pandemic, but those games, football games, weren't ever that sizable. K-State went four and six. I didn't travel the next year because it still was kind of worrisome. And, okay, that, you know, that was an okay season. Um, you know, I I went from the start of the 95 season um, to the pandemic missing two games, football games. So 
I mean, nearly 25 years, Mm -hmm. 18 years. I missed the Fresno State game um, when K-State with Ron Prince played in Fresno because uh, K-State with Frank Martin was in uh, Orlando with a preseason tournament. I chose that, and I chose wisely. That's a smart decision. And I didn't make it to the um, – I could have slept at an airport if I wanted to, if I wanted to get to the pinstripe bowl. But we already had Rob Casty on the ground in New York because he was already in there visiting friends. So we canceled our flights because of the blizzard and just stayed at home. Salute to you. So that was it until the pandemic hit. Um, and then that changed everything. And I'll be honest here. Our profession's changed so much. It has. Um, We've been traveling heavy for a number of years because it was all about the games. And it's still about the games, but uh, you can have a smaller presence at the game and still do the good job you need to. I don't think anyone thinks we've done a lesser job here because Michael Goins and Tim Fitzgerald and are writing from home and, and Cole Carmody is doing his postgame stuff from home. Um, just the way we do things now and the ability with an app called Otter – to record press conferences and interviews and put them in our shared group so we all have them immediately is there's so many revelations that have happened in our industry. I'm done sooner working from home. Is that a fly? There's a damn fly. <laughs> it's like 50 Where did you come seconds. from? It's huge. <laughs> That's funny. I'm done sooner working from home than I am actually at the game. A considerable amount of time earlier. I know. It's strange. It 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 is. It, it really is. Um, because you don't have to walk to a press conference. You don't have to, you just kind of start doing your thing. Um, and, you know, it's kind of nice, too, to be honest. They they can't get Jerome Tang on post game radio, so they just take the feed. So yeah. we get some of the po- podium feed mm-hmm. across the radio, which is it's something new for listeners. It's got to be kind of cool for them uh, to hear the media actually ask the questions um, at a NCAA tournament press conference. It's cool. Yeah, it's it's been odd. It's stressful. It's it's stressful because um, I cover K State. You lose a lot of your fandom covering the, your alma mater for as a journalist. Um, in fact, you see me wearing purple and power cats in my daily deliveries, but those shirts exist in this room. I mean, I just I, you don't wear those to game. You're they're covering the game. You don't wear fan clothing. You don't wear your the only time I wear purple at a game is when they're playing TCU. <laughs> it's literally my rule. I'm not favoring either team that way. Um, so to be at home and kind of able to vent a little bit, it doesn't help venting. It doesn't. It, it just kind of compounds everything. Yeah, I, I think at the, the Big 12 championship, um, we all agreed in the media that we almost died trying to hold everything in up in that press box. Um, but – uh, you you kind of you make it through and you do your job. And it's easier if you're a journalist that, you know, is let's take our friend Ryan Black, uh, who is a graduate of Georgia and covered K-State here and then covered Michigan State uh, for a while and then covered Kentucky. So he's on he's kind of covered this whole bracket. So he was covering the game from Kentucky. But he's a Georgia fan. Uh, he's he's disassociated. There's no roots there right. for him. Now, look, it's kind of natural for someone who starts to cover a team to get uh, generally to feel affection because if they're good players and good coaches, and I don't mean on the court, good people, right. you, you don't want bad for them. And mm-hmm. honestly, it's selfish too. You want to cover these things. You want to cover success. Right. It's no fun to cover a team that is terrible. I mean, unless um, now the only time in this profession, I, obviously you've been doing this longer than I have, but a coaching change, it'd be the only time where, a non-successful program would have any kind of interest to cover. Am mm-hmm. I correct in that mm-hmm. assumption? No. no you're, so, you're I right. mean, you're you right. want the teams you cover to have success. And that's the that's the KU effect on the Kansas City media. It's not really that they're KU fans. They're, they're fans of being able to cover Final Fours. Because in, in my career, uh, before I got into this leg of it, I covered KU at the 1993 New Orleans Final Four. And it still remains the greatest sporting event I've covered. And I just covered the Sugar Bowl and a Big 12 championship again in football. There's nothing like the Final Four. If Kansas State advances to the Final Four, 
I, and I look around the media that's traveling with K-State right now, and um, I'm, I'm just astonished how many young people now are in these positions because of the upheaval in our industry. You know, Kellis, prop, Kellis is easily the oldest guy on the road right mm-hmm. now with K-State in terms of regular riders. That's usually me easily. Um, and I guess D. Scott's out there, but he even works for the university now, so that doesn't really count as a reporter. Mm-hmm. And Kellis isn't that old. Uh, it used to be a bunch of old guys out there complaining about their backs and the weather constantly. You know, I want to get this season over with. I get home and uh, uh, have a beer. You know, just the grumpy old sports writer thing. And it's kind of fun. Um, it looked like that group in in Greensboro was having a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, but let let's be honest here. And I hope he's listening. Ryan Gilbert doesn't deserve this. He doesn't deserve anything nice in his life. Why Why is he going to get this? If they go to the Final Four, he gets a trip to New York City. He's your roommate right now. Do you trust him in New York City? No. Right. None of us do. <laughs> We're worried about him. We're worried that he's he's, he's like a giant Macaulay Culkin. And he's just going to— He kind of looks like him. No, he does. The haircut. He's like a Macaulay Culkin with a gambling problem. He doesn't gamble, though. He would tell you that. Yeah. He's, he also has a problem with the truth. The last, last question of the first half comes from Euler Cat 2. Could this be considered the best sports year ever for K-State? Big 12 football championship and a Sweet 16, at least for basketball. I know we won conference titles in football, basketball, and baseball in 2012 and 2013, but this just seems different because of the enthusiasm football and basketball have created this year. Yeah, I agree with Euler Cat. I, I do. 2012 was amazing. Um, but also having a big 12 title game, which didn't in 2012, you know, he just had a celebration on the field after the game. Well, they won, but did it seem like there was a, an opportunity for more that they kind of let down? Yeah. Like that's kind of the vibe. I wasn't here, but like, that'd be the vibe that I was the vibe that I got, you know, watching it from home. It's like, yes, we won the big 12, but like, that's what you had expected the entire season because they had been undefeated and you were hoping about a national championship. With the football team this year, it was kind of one of those things. It was like, well, they had that stumble in against Tulane, which made it that more um, made it that more of a successful season. And I, I, I don't know with the group they had in basketball in 2012. Like you knew that they were going to have a chance to be pretty good. With this group, they came out of nowhere. So I think, um, yeah, I agree with you, Oiler Cat. Like this just seems you know, different, and it seems like it's more sustainable than it was then. Yeah, I would agree. I I, I I don't want it to come across that I'm down on any year, but there's just been something about this year that is really special. Keep in mind that in 2000, um, oh, I went to the wrong year. In two, let's get to the right year. Uh, 2003 football, Big 12 title, that basketball team in 03 and 04 went 14 and 14. It was Jim Older Jeer, bless his heart, ninth in the Big 12. Um, and, you know, go back to 98, it still wasn't great. It, look, clearly, this is clearly for me, this is the best year because they had such a signature, emphatic, not emphatic, uh, just substantial win in the Big 12 championship against TCU. There was a defining moment. Right. It was so cool how they did it. Uh, and now we're getting those in basketball as they move down. I don't think there's any doubt if this team somehow wins two more and goes to the Final Four, this will be the greatest sports season in K-State sports history, the, by far. Not even close. But is this also the – this is also – we're at a time where you have a new brand of K-State. Jerome Tang is the brand of K-State basketball. When Bruce Weber won that Big 12 championship, he had been at other places – you know, this had, Frank Martin had been here. It kind of established a program. Bruce Weber was just kind of carrying the torch of what Frank had done. Jerome Tang is establishing himself here. When K State football won it in 2012, it's Bill Snyder. It's Colin Klein. Well, now it's Chris Kleiman. I feel like this is kind of uh, to steal the phrase from Keontae Johnson, a rebirth of K State athletics. And I think that's why this has been such an exciting year for fans because. Every single game that both of these teams have played, K-State fans have felt like their team is going to win. And they, they, they've come darn close. That's true. That's very, very true. 
That's it for the first half of this Powercat Questions podcast. Cole and Fitz talking together. We don't need the other two guys. We can fill some time. We'll be back with more of your questions from Wild Bass Station. We're sponsored by The Fridge. We appreciate their ongoing support, and we really appreciate you listening. Make sure you check out that 50% off special at Go Powercat. Go click that green join button. Get it done right now while this ad plays. Maybe I'll put three here so you got plenty of time. GoPowerCat.com's PowerCat podcast continues after this short break. If you're in the market for investment-worthy bags, watches, and fine jewelry, Rebag is the answer. Rebag is a luxury resale marketplace where each piece is carefully vetted and verified by experts to ensure quality and authenticity. If you're in the market, use Rebag to buy and sell finds from the world's top brands, including Hermes, Chanel, and Cartier. Head to Rebag.com to get 10% off your first purchase with code REBAG10. Shop today at Rebag.com. That's R-E-B-A-G.com. And use promo code REBAG10 for 10% off your first purchase. Welcome back to the Power Cat Podcast. Now, let's return to the GPC Studios. Welcome back to this edition of the Power Cat Questions Podcast, your NCAA Tournament Sweet 16 version of it. Ryan Gilbert and Zach Carlson are in New York City covering for Go Power Cat. Cole Carmody and myself are here in the GPC Studios, not even with dogs. It's a lonely place. Until they come through the door and start barking. Maybe we should have invited Gonzi over, Michael Goins, and he could have just, with his gravelly voice, just growled at us. Mm. That would be very entertaining for the listeners. It'd be awkward for him. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't do that. Speaking of awkward, if you're enjoying this podcast and you enjoy the daily deliveries and the walk and talks and all the free stuff we do, could we get you to subscribe if I offered you 50% off? Well, that's what's going on right now to celebrate this Sweet 16. Get on over to GoPowerCat.com. or part of the 24-7 Sports Network, which I got to tell you, folks, I've been with other networks uh, and different versions of those networks. This is the most incredible journalism experience I've had in terms of being integrated into a greater network. We are part of CBS Sports. I mean, there's discussions even rebranding us as CBS Sports 24-7 College, something like that. So uh, these are big, big things going on at 24-7, integrated into CBS. I hope to goodness sake if the Big 12 expands, and we should be getting information on that pretty soon, whatever what's going on in the Pac-12, that they can bring in some more schools. They have to expand the TV package, and then you know possibly CBS comes into that. We'll see how that all plays out. But get over there, subscribe, click that green join button, get your 50% off, and get ready, folks. It's going to be an incredible year. Uh, I, I just can't imagine this happening. I, this is so far beyond my realm. You had to replace a legend in Bill Snyder, and Gene Taylor found Chris Kleiman and took a lot of heat for it. And now that people have been around him, he's a different coach, he's a different man, but the goodness there and the way he represents K-State is so solid. And, you know, Bruce Weber won a couple Big 12 titles. You you have to always recognize how substantial that is. But there always seemed like there was something missing from that whole thing because in both of those years, he lost in the first round of the tournament, which is a hollow way to go out. And then the three worst years in the history of K-State basketball in a row took place before Jerome Tang came in and and I think we can all agree this isn't just about the success on the court. It's about the entire program and the, the amazing energy around the program. It's really cool. Yep. As we get into the questions here for the second half, the first question comes from the boss cat. How do you guys think that the aura of playing at Madison Square Garden will impact the New York City players in the game? I know they'll downplay it some, but every little kid from New York City dreams of playing at MSG. Yeah. And why wouldn't they? So cool. It is. Um, as someone who's covered a game in there, because was it Hugs that played there in Notre Dame? It was, I believe they oh, said Frank. that was Michael Beasley's very first, um, okay, so one of his first tournaments. So that had been Frank. Frank, yeah. yeah. Okay. I remember going to that. It's funny how little we remember from that trip. I remember our room being at a Hilton, being really small. Um, we had a nice dinner. We had a nice night out where we pub crawled and we ended up in Jay-Z's bar. Yeah, that was... Did you meet Brett Yormark? No, but what was funny about it is, um, let's be honest, a bunch of uh, 30, 40-something 
white people from Kansas walk into Jay Z's bar. It seems like a joke, but it wasn't. <laughs> they were very kind. Uh, they gave us a private room uh, with pool tables, and it was a part. It was a very expensive room with a mm-hmm. waitress. Um, and I don't think it was as much as an act of kindness as get them out of our main area. <laughs> But it was great. We had fun. And it was fine. I mean, we, we enjoyed, we were there for each other, not everything else. Went to a, a bar uh, that overlooked at a patio, an outdoor patio. You walk out and overlooked um, Empire State Building. And they had like these giant fur coats that everyone could put on. So you'd be warm enough. It was cool. But um, yeah, it covered a game there is amazing. And I don't know how they'll handle it. I just have no idea. And you might be able to lump Keontae into that as mm-hmm. an East Coast kid from Virginia. He might have the same thing. This is a big stage. But they need to remember they're not the little guys on the big stage. They are the top seed in this this regional final. So let's let's see what they can do. Hopefully they all rise up. It's an amazing story. If you know the full background of Orlando Blackman being from Brooklyn, and we've had phases of this. Michael Goins is working on a story about this, I believe. Um, it's really cool. New York City, the Big Apple, has meant a lot to Kansas State basketball and the Little Apple. And I think, I really honestly think, this is going to be something substantial for recruiting. Mm-hmm. When these kids from around New York City see the kind of success these kids are having by going to the middle of Kansas and Jerome Tang will gladly play this up because this has been my argument about inner city kids, big city kids, not wanting to come to a rural ag and engineering school. For every one of those, I truly believe there's a mom that wants their child in an environment like Manhattan and not going to a place like Memphis, Mm -hmm. not going to a place like Alabama, where apparently you're not held accountable for your bad decisions but coming to Kansas State. So this could be enormous for Kansas State recruiting. I think what is so cool about all of this is right now, K-State is the story of the tournament. Like you look around college basketball, if there's one player that fans want to watch, it's that five, six point guard from Harlem. And where does he get to go? He gets to go back to his home in New York and play at Madison Square Garden. I mean, I think this is going to be better for K-State than if they would have even been in Kansas City. I mean, these guys are going to be motivated. They're going to be fired up. And it's not just Marquise. Let's not forget that. It's Naquan Tomlin, too. The same Naquan Tomlin who never played a game of organized basketball until he got to college. This in case be, you didn't know that. You know, they, it's not like they haven't said that at all in the That's amazing to think this will be his first yeah. organized basketball game in, in his home city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How cool is that? So you get Naquan, you get Marquise. Ish Masood also returns home, and so, as does Tyke Green. And Curtis Kelly. Let's not overlook that, too. Curtis Kelly, the GA, uh, gets to go back home. So there is a huge portion of this roster that is returning home. And I I just don't see any way that they don't live up to the hype. Like, Marquise it has a flair for the dramatic. He would be a what? great actor. Oh, Mar- he would be, actually. Because he knows how to be dramatic. And there's going to be some serious drama that takes place on Thursday and hopefully Saturday night because um, these guys are good enough to win. They're good enough to be anybody that's left in this tournament. It's going to be like playing a home game for those guys. I mean, they may have never played there, but just that feeling of being home, playing in front of friends and family and, and envisioning what they've always dreamt about, there's something special there. Yep. There is. And, and hopefully, hopefully Zach Carlson and Ryan Gilbert don't commit too many crimes that's always important but i've instructed them they must eat from a sidewalk hot dog vendor they're gonna go to like they're gonna go they'll go to qdoba or like a chipotle that's, that's there it's very zach yeah zach zach likes to travel amongst the known mm-hmm. which is fine i appreciate that particularly on work days i'm not gambling on anything on a work day Last time I did that was in St. Louis when we ate at a weird sub shop and I got food poisoning. Not doing it ever again. We're eating pretty safe on work days now. But, yeah, it's it's incredible. Um, I'm excited for these guys. Hopefully that doesn't become too overwhelming. I'm sure they will have a lot of media attention because Kentucky's not there. Purdue's not there. Um, you know, other schools that might have been seen as Memphis was 
knocked mm-hmm. out. Um, I kind of had a little, not really a brush up, but Duke, by the way, too. Um, yep, Duke, one of one of the twenty four seven podcast producers in the New York area, and he was disappointed by the field. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I I don't have much tolerance. I don't have much for uh, name brand addiction. I like good sports, good sports. And if you watch Kansas State, that team was a lot more fun to watch than Duke or Kentucky this year. Even Memphis was fun to watch at times. Mm-hmm. That that team K-State put on the court against Kentucky, that's a blast. It's hard to believe that's that's a Kansas State team. Yeah. After so many years of walk it up and play suffocating defense, this is the brand now. Pretty cool. Along those same lines from Cat in Colorado, he says it's unrealistic to expect another performance from Marquise like his Kentucky effort. But to win big games, someone or two need to play over their head. Based on matchups, who do you like to do that against Michigan State? I haven't looked at Michigan State enough. I mean, I I didn't even get to see him play because I was recording my TV show. Um, so uh, I, I'll hopefully get into that more. But you're right. Someone has to has to step up. I think Marquise will be good. Um, but I do fear with uh, maybe pressing to try to replicate it. He kind of gets into that once in a while. Mm-hmm. It was so easy because Kentucky did such a horrible job preparing for him. You can't let him get into the lane with the ability to have vision to look around. You know, I, I don't. Calipari's a horrible coach. But, um, it, yeah, they've got, I mean, so many guys that can do this. Desi Sills. Saved the day at one stretch of the game. Um, about broke a hip, which is, you know, Desi, I'm I'm kind of the same way. When I fall, I might break a hip. <laughs> uh, and then Keontae and, and Naquan can certainly ramp it up. David Gasson showed moments of really getting ready to go. Bebe didn't even really get into the action. I don't think he was kind of meant for that game. He seemed the most physically adept to battle, but did, he wasn't out there very long. Ty Key's strong enough to battle those games. And let's not forget, Ty Key's had a come-to-the-rescue game, too. Mm-hmm. So they've, they've got dudes all over the court that can do it. But you're right. Someone needs to be extraordinary in these environments. And that's true if you're Kansas, Kentucky, Duke, or Kansas State. You're, some dude, one of your many dudes, has to step up and get it done. So this is interesting. And this has been talked about a little bit um, in preparation for this game. But Michigan State, they are like the typical Big Ten team. Um, and, and I mean that in both a negative and a positive way, I guess you could say. Uh, would you like to take a guess at how many turnovers or what their percentage of turnovers they get on possessions are? No, I do. Okay. For reference, there are 363 teams in NCAA Division One. Michigan State ranks 339th in turnover possessions percentage in other words they have only t- forced turnovers on 14 percent of possessions of Is opponents right? possessions that throughout doesn't the entire seem season. on brand at all basically the way people have talked about it is Michigan State is the type of team that plays very good on ball defense but they don't take too many chances I, I would venture to say that is because their athleticism is Down. is lacking right. right if you why why try and go get a steal if you're not athletic enough to go get a steal so they play good on ball defense they play pretty good three point defense and then they go get a rebound on the flip side they don't get offensive rebounds they make a lot of three pointers but they don't shoot the three that often it just screams like a team that knows they're not that athletic and they try and do all the little things to win I think that's really hard to do against K-State because they're going to push the tempo. They're going to turn this into a full-court game, not a half-court game. And if they get hot, there's not much Michigan State's going to be able to do. Michigan State, our own Ryan Wallace put the piece up um, previewing the the region um, on Tuesday morning. Michigan State has only come back to win a game in which they trailed by 10 or more points one time this season. K-State feels like they always get up at least close to get up by double digits it seems like every single game no no matter if they win or if they lose michigan state is not built to come from behind k-state is going to have a really good chance if they start out hot to get this thing going and and fits they don't cause turnovers k-state has turned the ball over quite a bit but the one person that we always say if they don't turn the ball over they're going to be really successful is marquis noel 
Captain Collar doesn't know if Marquise can have a repeat performance, but just based solely on that statistic and the fact that Marquise is going back home to Madison Square Garden, I like it. I think that is my going to be my player to click. Well, I I got to say this about Marquise and this team: they fell behind at the start of the second half because they got sloppy, and then as Jerome Ting noted in post game, they didn't have any turnovers. After that, I don't know what the time was, if it was the final 16 minutes or final 14 or 12 minutes. They had no turnovers. If this team takes care of the ball, they will beat anybody in this tournament in that game. If this team stays at 11 turnovers or fewer, I've been saying 12, but 11 now has been statistically proven as their their line. If they keep it at 11 or fewer, they're going to win almost every time. And you get up into the teens, 12 and above into the teens, you're in trouble. If they take care of the ball and value possessions, value possessions, what you do at the end of the game, you need to make a play, you're focused, let's run the set perfectly, but you need to have that feeling throughout the game. And if they can do that four more times this season, they could be there. At center court in Houston, they could be there. But again, these teams are good. They're not overwhelming. There's not a matchup issue. Purdue would have proposed, would have posed that. That would have been interesting. What a choke job, by the way. But I also think it proved that was their Achilles heel. Yeah. They, they just ran circles around him. And they front guarded him. They took him out. I. I bet K-State to the Final Four in November. So needless to say, I hope they do that, and I regret not betting more. Mm -hmm. Me too. Me too. Next question comes from here for LT Cat. With all the free national TV exposure for Tang and the basketball program, what does this do to aid recruiting? It's enormous. I don't even think it's just TV. Let's talk about the viral sensations on Twitter right now. Well, besides all the highlight reel passes and yeah. dunks and all that that locker room video of the pre pregame hype uh, i don't know if you could have could design anything better in social media to attract young players they look like they're having so much fun right before a game where teams are supposed to be nervous they don't look nervous don't look they look nervous. confident they they don't look loosey goosey right that's a term we use in the coaching profession they look all loosey goosey they're not ready yep. to play they look confident they look confident like they know they're going to go out there and they're going to kick some butt. That is a that is, there's a huge difference between being confident and then just, you know, not and just faking it. Well, these guys are confident and that video is incredible. That video I, I think it must've been in an Oklahoma State locker room. And they've done it for they do it all over the game, tournament games. But now. they just caught that one. Um what was the word you used? It everything was so sincere in that video. There was nothing no playing to the camera. The camera just happened to be observing something 100% genuine mm -hmm. that was going on and how they were all kind of synced. They were all in unison together. I think that is a brilliant tactic to not just talk about a bunch of words and send your team out there. Let's just kind of, it's almost like a spiritual moment. Mm-hmm. Um, with that little baby song, yeah, that's right. I, you knew that. Oh yeah, yeah. That is impressive, right uh, there. I was listening to some little baby. Uh, <laughs> you know, it turns out he's not actually a baby at all. <laughs> I thought I was really impressed that a, a, an infant could make this kind of music, and it turns out he's a he's a man. Uh, it, it's it's amazing to watch that video. If I'm a kid, I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't even talk about race or culture. Yeah. If I'm from Weskin, Kansas, yeah. I'm like, man, I want to be part of that team. And just the coaching, the coaches, just Tang is just, he's, he's, he is the leader of the pack. Like, like there's just, it's beyond words. And that's what we're supposed to do in a podcast is we're supposed to talk about things, but you just watch that video and there's just a, you just develop these feelings. It's like, I'm terrible at basketball. I was never even close to being any good at basketball, but I feel like in that moment I could put the uniform on and go have success. Mm -hmm. And that's why they win. That's why they win. I, I'm, I'm, I'm down for this. He, he coach Tang has so much um, in the bank invested right now. 
if he wanted to take headphones to the sideline and call a an extended timeout and hit play <laughs> on a little baby on the sideline and everyone vibe back up, kind of get back in sync, I would buy into it. I'm buying everything right now. So uh, it's incredible. Yeah, that and – I. I loved it because it's so much my humor, but the Dream Dowling interview about how Coach Tang pushes the players off the table because his <laughs> knees hurt after jumping onto into the stands. And when they're busting on each other like that, it also shows the 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 fun culture they have inside that program. Yep, yep, I agree. Um, next question comes from Calm Manhattan Waters. If Houston were to play Texas in the next round, who winning benefits the Big 12 more? That's a great question, one I've thought about. It's I, Texas I'm, right now. You know what's funny about this? I think this? it's Texas. Yeah, I would agree with that. And what's funny about it is I don't have the same anti-Texas feelings for basketball I do for football. You know? If Chris Beard was there, though, I think I would. You might be right. You might be right. There's a soft Coach spot Terry in my is, heart for him. Is, is kind of a cool dude. Yeah. I don't know about the glasses. But he pulls them off. Yeah. Um. He didn't take his shirt off either. That's always a bonus for coach. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I would agree with Texas, uh, but I would say this. The Big 12 can't lose. No. They, they won't lose that game, particularly if, you know, K-State can make it to the Final Four, and one of those is. I'm really disappointed in the Big 12, but I think this tournament has shown what the transfer portal has done, and this has been something I've been on in football with TV ratings I would love to see, and I think I don't think you consider Houston a national brand in basketball. They're, they're working on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Texas is Texas, but Carolina didn't make the tournament. Kansas and Duke and North Carolina and um, so many of these name pro Kentucky, they're gone. They're out. UCLA still hovering around there. If we end up with a Final Four of not regular household names for college basketball. I want to see what happens to the TV ratings because I have always said fans find good teams, particularly in the betting environment now. They just want to watch good games. They want to have fun things upon which to bet. And while I recognize the fact that a Kansas or Kentucky has an embedded huge national fan base, a lot of T-shirt fans, which I don't mean as a you know insult, but – Anyone that goes out and buys clothing without a degree to a college program or a tie, a family mm-hmm. tie to the college program, is a T-shirt fan. Say, for example, if you did that with Duke. <laughs> I wonder who that could be. I don't know. But uh, he poor guy gets busted on all the time. <laughs> and I, I just think that it's really good. It would be interesting to see what ESPN and CBS and – Fox wouldn't want this. What if the final four is four schools that nobody thought would be there at the start of the year? It's not even Texas or Houston. I don't even know who's in that bracket. I don't have my bracket in front of me. But four schools end up in the final four that are like, oh, and the ratings are the same. What What's that do to your bubble? What's that do to you? We want to buy all the brands up instead of just good competition. And that's something that um, the Pac-12 schools don't get, you know, In football, maybe Oregon and Washington are big brands, but the brand of football they play isn't necessarily as entertaining as what people see in the Big 12, and that's why the Big 12 is getting a bigger contract. I mean, you could could seriously have a Final Four of – you look at the games here. UConn plays Arkansas. um, Tennessee plays Florida Atlantic. UCLA plays Gonzaga. I mean, if UCLA doesn't make it out of that region – Yeah. you're you're struggling there. I mean, what if you had a Creighton, K State, Miami, and Gonzaga Final Four? Yeah, where you have, which is a very realistic possibility, by the way. You have one power in quote unquote power in Gonzaga, and I would don't even think they're necessarily considered a blue blood. Um, they're just maybe more of a name brand in college basketball. But I mean, there's just I hope that if K State doesn't make it to the Final Four. Michigan State doesn't. I mean, that that's a – it's kind of a name brand. Yeah, it is. But, I mean, how cool would it be if, you know, you don't have a Final Four with a bunch of name brands? I, I think people would watch. I think there would be more people that watch because guess what? The name brands that are 
that were in this NCAA tournament obviously weren't that good. Kentucky wasn't that good. Duke wasn't that good. Kansas lost in the second round. They kind of they summed up our suspicions. They really maybe weren't as good as people thought they were. So, yeah, I mean, I, I want a tournament without – I want a Final Four without a bunch of name brands. In it. I think it would be cool. Yeah. It would really, be really good and, and good for the Big 12. You know, Gonzaga might be in the Big 12 if Brett Yormark gets his Western expansion and then has the next phase of a basketball-only expansion – what some people can't wrap. They're, that just blows the minds of people. They can't understand. Why would you do that? They don't contribute. Much. No, they'd be separate contracts. Basketball and football be separated out. Um, and Creighton is a possibility. If they go four schools for that, Creighton makes a lot of sense to bring in as another basketball program that plays other sports because it's regional with Big 12, mm-hmm. traditional Big 8 schools. Right. Yep. Last question of the podcast comes from Doug142. What would be more important to K-State? Proving what Coach Snyder built can be sustained by others with Kleiman's Big 12 title or restoring the hoops legacy if Coach Tang can lead the Wildcats to the Final Four this week? Mm. I suspect Doug's a fellow old, maybe. Um, And so we kind of lean into basketball a little bit because we've, we've been starved for this. We've had just little tastes. It, you know, it's like we wandered around the desert for a number of years looking for paradise. Uh, and we ended up with, you know, coaches who simply weren't up to the task. And an athletic department that had shifted resources because of limited resources over to football. And we can't argue about that was a good decision because mm-hmm. it obviously was. But it did come at the expense of basketball in that limited sources environment. Now the sources aren't resources aren't limited like they were. It's hard. It's hard for the fans. You know, a lot of these schools have different fan bases for football or basketball, Michigan or, you know, probably Michigan state to a degree. <coughs> Kansas. <coughs> at, at, yeah. At little OK state, everyone's got to pitch in. That's kind of the way the school is. So having both of them would be remarkable, but, uh, from a straight financial and security situation, you got to be good in football if you're Kansas State. If if there's another whole nother shift of realignment out there, and K State's four and eight for a few years in football, you're gonna get left out. But if K State's winning Big Twelve titles, you can't leave them out. Basketball just doesn't seem to matter as much, but I think what we're going to find from Brett Yormark is he's going to make them pay for it. Because if they've said 10% of the TV contracts is basketball, which would work out in the new contract to be about $3 million of the contract is for basketball, which is ludicrous. And he's valued, he's had outsiders value the basketball product at $25 million alone. <laughs> So if you get the other $27 million from football, that's the thing. Is they're going to get caught in the lie. They can't say, well, we were screwing you over on basketball. So now that you're taking basketball out, that's half your worth. Well, that's not how it works. You told us it was 10%. <clears throat> so it's, yeah, I think he's found a way to kind of get them at the negotiating table. And we won't see it with this first contract that's just been signed but coming around in five to seven years we'll see this i think i think the answer to this question can be both right i feel like for football yes they won a big 12 title this year and that was huge they made it to the sugar bowl amazing i feel like fans still want to see some sustained success and it's harder to do that in football than it is in basketball it really is if k-state can back Next year up with another solid season, I think fans will be ready to say, all right, the football is back to where it needs to be. With basketball, if K-State makes the Final Four, basketball's back. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at the recruiting class they're bringing in. You you trust the coaches that they have. Like Now you start to feel like this K-State basketball team can compete for this level every single season. I don't know if fans are necessarily ready to say that about football yet because it takes longer to build up the program. With basketball, it can literally flip overnight. And, I mean, I think I think a lot of fans maybe already are there, even without the Final Four with the basketball program. So I guess maybe the answer is 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 climbing in football, I guess, if I were to pick. But, I mean, 
getting K-State to a Final Four would be the best story in sports this year. A team picked to finish last in their conference with two players when the coach was hired and making the Final Four. I mean, you literally can't write anything. That's 30 for 30 documentary. Like it is. Yeah. You can't write anything. You can't script it any better. Let's put it this way. K-State has a proud tradition in basketball. But you have to be older than me to remember the Final Fours. The last Final Four was in March of 1964, and I was born in June of 1964. So my lifetime has not included a Final Four for Kansas State. A lot of basketball success and great games and high rankings. One of the things I've absolutely loved about Jerome Tang from the very start, and he embraced it from the very start, was he knew that tradition. He knows the coaches that have been here. He knows that this was a blue blood for many years in basketball. And it's a shame that Kansas State fell off the end of the table and there was no way to predict it right when the ESPN era began. Because that's really now what's framed the blue bloods. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just be good then, but if you had history before that, like Kansas like UCLA, like so many other programs, and you sustained it into the ESPN era where you were being shown in the biggest, most important time slots of college basketball broadcasting, you're set in stone now as a blue blood. K-State squandered that, so let's see if they can stir it back to life, and maybe if they can make it to Houston. If they can get through two games in New York and get to Houston, the national media will be forced to talk about the incredible history of Kansas State basketball and how it went dormant. By God, Kansas State having success in this season when the Blue Bloods are all dying off, it's like dinosaurs roaming the earth again. You'll have to figure it out, but you'll appreciate it if it happens. Is that it? That's it. That's it for here. We'll have plenty of coverage coming from New York City, the New York Bureau is two blocks south of Times Square, I believe, um, for Go Power Cat. And the guys are going to kill it. They have media on Wednesday. Today is Tuesday. And uh, then, of course, the game is Thursday evening at 5 o'clock. And I might have a special video podcast with Ryan Gilbert between now and then. Uh, I'm thinking about turning off his camera because... You, know, you just, don't want to break his camera. Well, he's just not that he's Yeah. He's hideous. We can just say it. He's he's hideous. You said that, not me. Okay. Yeah, you have to live with him. (laughs) I'm Fitz. I love my guys. They do a great job. We appreciate you listening. We appreciate you watching the daily deliveries. Ryan Gilbert's killing the walk and talks, even though he's way too analytical. (laughs) He's Mr. Analytical. He and I have different approaches, and I think it shocks some people, but uh, uh, he will have them uh, from New York City. And uh, the coverage will keep coming. If you're not subscribing, 50% off right now at Go Power Cat. Click that green join button. Become part of the family. We have a lot of fun covering a very fun season and future of Kansas State sports. Thank you for listening to the Power Cat podcast. Make sure you're subscribing to our show at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. PowerCat Podcast. All rights reserved. GoPowerCat.com. With Blue Link Plus, you can access your Hyundai Tucson Limited remotely. Doors unlocked. Temperature set. Lost car found. There it is. Get complimentary class leading Blue Link Plus. Call 562-314-4603 for complete details. There, it's Gary Parish with the Ion College Basketball Podcast, part of the CBS Sports Podcast Network. We are still in the early weeks of conference play, which means there's no better time to tap in. Every Sunday night and Wednesday and Friday mornings, you can expect an episode in your feed highlighting everything you need to know from the sport of college basketball, conference races, bracketology, coaching rumors. We'll talk about it all and be there with you at least three times a week as March Madness approaches. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast. To find us, Search for I Own College Basketball in your podcast app of choice.